Hi guys, welcome to the Harness, uh, the webinar called Harness the Power of the Curriculum Design Thinking Process. I'm Charlotte, I'm the Curriculum Designer Wonder Workshop, and we also have a guest speaker, Lionel, from the New York City Department of Education. Other thing we wanted to point out is to make sure that you guys join um, the coding and robotics community on EdWeb, edweb.net slash code. This is a great place where you're gonna get resources, online discussions, and this is actually where you're gonna access the archive for this webinar in case you wanna go back and check it out. Uh, if you are watching this not live and you're watching it recorded, this is also where you're gonna be able to take a quiz to get your CE certificates, and you can also see your own EdWeb webinar activity as you attend more of these webinars. Last but not least, your CE certificate. If you have logged on with your EdWebinar email address, um, your certificate will be, and you pre-registered, your certificate will be sent to you um, 24 hours after this webinar. If you join the session only by phone or you're watching it um, as a recording, make sure you go once again to edweb.net slash code. You'll take a quiz, and basically that'll give you your certificate. And especially um, if you want to use these certificates as part of your PD, if you have any questions about specific questions for your state, uh, go to home.edweb.net slash edwebyourstate. Um, we'll host that link also in attendee chat. Uh, Lionel, I believe New York, it's CTLE, yes? Yes, yeah, I just put it in the chat. It's, it's the CTLE uh, credits that you receive uh, for your required uh, professional development, it, This is the CE is the same thing. So yeah, just called something different. So. Yep, great. Okay, we're gonna dive right in because we've got an hour to cover a lot. So today, uh, we're talking about the curriculum design thinking process. Um, we're gonna dive into uh, a lot of different subject areas. First, we're gonna talk about the design thinking process alone, and then we're also going to then talk about how we can use curriculum design thinking to help create uh, engaging and authentic and also uh, powerful curriculum for teachers and students. So before we go into that, we wanted to share a little bit about us. So, you know, as I said, I'm Charlotte Chang, the curriculum designer at Wonder Workshop. We make robots that teach kids how to code. My background is I actually got a master's in elementary education at Stanford. I spent about 15 years in ed tech and also several of those years teaching, um, including literacy intervention for K-5 students and also storytelling and also college preparation for uh, sixth grade students all the way up to 12. How about you, Lionel? What's your background? So yes, my name's uh, Lionel Bergeron, and I am currently the director of elementary school computer science academics here in New York City, part of the Department of Ed. Um, we started an initiative here a little over two years ago um, with the mayor, and the goal is to have computer science taught in all grade bands um, for all students. And so uh, my background is I moved to New York about 15, uh, almost 16 years ago. I was a middle school special ed teacher in the South Bronx, and then I worked for New York City Special Ed uh, District, which is a citywide district as a uh, technology integration coach in educational technology. And through the Hour of Code, got involved with code.org and Scratch, and from there, learned a lot more about computer science. And so I actually know Charlotte because um, Wonder Workshop and the Dash and Dot is part of our uh, intensive uh, sequence, um, which is a year-long implementation from kindergarten through fifth grade and actually pre-K right now. And so um, it's a big part of our uh, unit of ro around robots. So, yeah. Awesome. And I also forgot we were supposed to do our high five. Wait, I'm going to go oh. this way. Ready? One, two, three. Yep. Eh. Okay. Yeah, we practiced really hard, you guys. Just forgot to bring that up. Um, also, feel free to follow us on Twitter. Our, our Twitter handles are on the screen. Um, and then EdWeb has also shared our emails with you in case you have any questions after this webinar. Feel free to send us an email. Now it's your turn. We want to learn a little bit more about you. And some of you guys have already shared this, but where are you from? What is your role in education? I'm going to give you guys about a minute to share. Um, hi. So we've got Tamara from Chicago, Illinois. I beforehand, I noticed people were for coming from Poland, um, New York City. Well, we got we got New York City, uh, Lionel. Yes, uh, nice. not, Lori's from Virginia. North. Oh, wow. That's great. Los Angeles, professor of ed. 
music education, editor, paraprofessional, teaching artist, curriculum lead. Yep. That that is great. Keep them coming, guys. I'm gonna give it ten more seconds. I'd love to know. Instructional tech and tech integration, fifty percent each. Wow. That's a cool role. We got someone from Alberta. Okay, great. ESL teacher. That is great. That really helps us know, you know, who's attending and and that really helps us get to the next question. What are you hoping to take away from this webinar? Because you guys are coming from so many different roles, so many different places, we wanted to get a quick sense of what you're hoping to get out of this webinar. You know, something drew you to this webinar. What was it? So you're hoping for scope and sequence, for ideas. That's great. Our dash and dot different from the new Q robot. If you have specific questions like that, feel free to add that to the, once again, that Q question icon at the top, because then we can address it. Implement the design thinking process in my workshops. Yes, we will definitely address that. Problem, problem solving connections, yeah. Application design thinking. Oh, they want to hear conversations? We got your conversations. <laughs> we'll make that happen. Cool. Ideas for designing high quality activities. We'll definitely cover that too. Someone did thumbs up. Challenges for kids and invention literacy. I've never heard of it said that way before. I'm going to write that down. Invention literacy. I agree. We need to start developing that literacy skill. All right, I'm going to move forward, guys. These are all great comments. I just want to make sure we have enough time to answer your questions at the end. So before we start, oh, this is one last question. I, I want to get a sense of who knows what the design thinking process is. So if you could define in one sentence, and I know it's only one sentence, what is the design thinking process to you? I've included some images of graphics that people have used to talk about the design thinking process, but what is design thinking process for you? Wendy says, new ideas for positive outcomes. That's cool. It definitely, it's an iterative design. It's an instructional design. It can be instructional design. We're going to walk through lots of different examples beyond that, too. Build, share, reflect. Yep. Process to design something. Planning instruction with the end in mind. Backwards design. Backwards design, too. I do that a lot. Fluid, five-step process with strong collaboration with others. These are all great definitions. I love how you guys are coming in with all this knowledge already. So I'm going to actually use an old school <laughs> definition here. Design thinking process is an iterative problem solving methodology used in a variety of business fields. And what I mean by a variety of business fields is that people from IDEO who are designing solutions for the best soap dispenser, <laughs> all, the, all the way to Lionel and me who are designing curriculum, we use the design thinking process. Now, Tim Brown, the CEO of IDEO, has been credited for creating this name. And what he has to say is that design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of the people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. So like I said, IDEO sort of looks at design thinking with this business perspective and this business approach. Um, and if you look back here, the center image is what IDEO has identified. These stages, these phases of the design thinking process is empathize, divine, ideate, prototype, and test. Now for curriculum design thinking, I've actually broken out a little bit further because I think actually the prototype stage is pretty, it's a large stage, so we're breaking down into two steps. We're gonna walk you through this, quickly define it, and then we're gonna walk you through an example just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Now the first phase of design thinking is this concept of understanding. What we mean by understanding is you want to think about who is your audience, what you're designing, and the problem you're trying to solve. The first thing you should really think about is your audience, what are their interests, and what are their needs. The next stage is defining. So once you've sort of learned how to empathize with your audience, then start defining the problem you want to solve or the message you want to convey to that audience. The next step is to ideate. So this is when you're going to try and brainstorm as many solutions as possible <laughs> Think outside of the box. There is no wrong answer at this phase so that you can really get creative with your solutions. Now, these two, plan and build, are part of that prototyping phase. So for this first phase, we wanted to talk about planning. You want to select one or two ideas that you ideated and flush it out with details and develop a design that you can then, for the next phase, build. So you can build a prototype that represents your ideas in the best way possible. 
Now, with, when you're building, because it's a prototype, you don't want to use a lot of um, fancy materials. You just want it to be quick and dirty so that you can quickly get to the next phase, which is test. Because you want to test your prototype. You, by testing your prototype, you present it to your users, and then you gather feedback from your users to improve your design. Now, someone said that design thinking is uh, iteration. because It's because this whole process is cyclical. After you test it and you get that feedback, the very next thing you think about, once again, is that audience. And check again, is that prototype, is your solution really um, addressing that problem that you defined early on? And it's not just a full circle. You can also make little circles. You can just go back and forth between understanding and defining, understanding and defining before you get that problem really refined before you move on to the ideate solution. So there's a lot of ways to def uh, talk about design thinking process. But moving forward in this webinar, we're going to sort of use this structure to talk about its elements. So we figured we'd use an example real quick about the design thinking process. And it's puppies. I just got a puppy last year. So that's why I picked this topic. So for example here, the understand phase when it comes to puppies is you need to understand your audience. Um, I just want to make sure I got this. Yeah. You need to understand your audience. So with this, the audience is puppies. And you want to think about what are the puppies' needs and what are their interests, right? A puppy wants uh, affection, attention. They need food. They need to be entertained. You, you sort of want to play around with puppies, check out what they do. That's how you're going to understand your audience. The next stage, which Lionel's going to describe, is? Oh, so it's defining the problem. Um, and so... <laughs> One of the things about this in particular is that it's often seen as a problem and then it gets associated with the idea of problem solving and you know problem being negative. But it's important to remember also that problems can be challenges or wants or needs or things that um, you know, you're looking just to discover. And so with the puppy, you want to explore uh, what uh, puppy problems are in the broad sense. And you really want kids to think broadly in the you know that they come up with multiple ideas because um it helps them focus later on so then they identify a specific problem you know puppies are bored when their uh humans aren't away and so uh, they need something to keep them engaged so even that idea of okay so now i have the problem of that they need something to keep them engaged when their owners are away but then you could even get that down a little bit smaller define the problem even a little bit more or start there because like what Charlotte had mentioned before is that you could define, come up with possible solutions. And if there's too many solutions, kind of like redefine your problem or your challenge to something a little more specific. So starting broad allows you to kind of work, work it down versus like, I want a, a blue toy that, you know, bounces up and down because that's what my puppy wants. But without doing all the other things, you know, you're more likely to run into failures that way. So. Agreed. Great tips, Lionel. The next stage we talked about is ideating solutions. So going back, we said that you know uh, puppies get bored when their humans are away and they need something to engage them. Once again, this is a place where you're gonna brainstorm ideas on how to keep those puppies engaged and entertained. All right, and when we say think outside of the box, you know, here I should show a photo of a ball, but think outside of that, you know, um, if you look outside in the like the the current um, pet toy market. Uh, there's tons of toys. Where there's video screens so you can video chat with your dog while you're away. Um, there's food toys. There's scratching. Po uh, there's basically um, toys where you can pull on something to release food for you. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can solve this problem. And in the ID8 phase, you want to just list as many as you can. Um, once again, think broad. Think be creative. And can just to add a little something here, I think this is one of the hardest things if you're using this uh, design thinking methodology in your students' activities and also adults when they're trying to like come up with curriculum ideas. I think this is one of the hardest things for uh, adults and students to do, um, especially in the beginning stages because they're like, oh, that's not a good idea. And they dismiss everything. Instead of just like putting it on paper, you can always get rid of it later. There's no bad idea. And, you know, I was working with a group of students today and um, they were trying to like learn how to fold, create uh, paper airplanes. And you're like, no, just try it. And like, no, it's wrong. It's wrong. I'm like, but you just try it. Just put it out there. Get it out there. Um, because 
you know, inside your head, nobody knows about it and, you know, getting it out and really, you know, thinking it through and expressing it is very important. So. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes I go by the motto of instead of saying yes, but say yes, and right. This is from improv. And you can do that also during your ideation phase. You know, don't don't say don't just say yes, but and ha- add exceptions. Everything is accepted. Everything is a right answer at this point, because that's how you're going to let the creative um, creative juices flow, basically. So the next phase is develop and design a plan. Lionel, what do we do in this phase? <laughs> yeah, and, and so um, uh, Charlotte had mentioned before that, you know, taking that concept of prototyping and breaking it up into two parts, the plan and build. Um, and so uh, one of the first things you can do too is that the planning stage also helps you kind of really um, start to, you know, get focused on what your um, final solution might be. And so some of the things, you know, it's at the bottom of the list, but first maybe identifying uh, what materials you might need at first, or what what do you have available to you right now to kind of start testing out your um, your different ideas? And then what you're going to do is like, okay, well, let's see, uh, what will the toy look like? Drawing it out, like having students draw and sketch, and you know, come up with a plan before actually building something is very important. Um, I don't know if you've tried to build something without a plan; uh, it often just falls apart almost immediately. So get it on paper, even if it's a little bit of a sketch. Um, and then also how you plan on building your toy, um, you know, that goes into the, again, the materials, but it also goes into the process. And like, you know, if you're on a team, like, are you each building your own interpretation of what you came up with or are you building it as a team, you know, really work through that plan before you get to the building phase, um, you know, especially with students, you know, getting them to try to, uh, over, even adults like, okay, you guys are going to build a curriculum and then everybody comes together and everybody has their own idea of what that build was supposed to look like versus, you know, collaborating and working together on it. So, Yeah. And then next, moving on to the next phase, once again, this is also about the prototype phase, is you're actually going to build that prototype. Just like Lionel said, once you rec- uh, identify the resources, materials you want to use, how you're going to build it and what it's going to look like, you use that to inform your building phase so you can be really efficient about what you're building. So with your students, you can also talk to them about that. You know, look at if you're getting lost in the weeds, go back to your plan. What's your next step? What's the next thing you need to build? It helps them use that as a reference. And the next thing is use minimal resources to create a prototype that represents your toy idea. Because in this sense, you know, you're not trying to make that ball perfect. Let's say you decided that your solution is going to be a food toy, like I said. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is just a way to test your idea to represent that idea. Like I like to say in this in this uh, metaphor, keep it rough right? <laughs> Keep it nice and rough. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't need to fine tune. Oh, no, Lionel's face bombing me. Okay, <laughs> it's all right. Um, and so when you're working with students, make sure they're, you know, they, they recognize that because you know, you've got one or two of those students in your class where they just want to make it perfect. Keep them it, like focus on the fact that you just want to represent that idea very quickly and then move on to the next phase. Because the next phase is extremely impo- important. What is that one, Lionel? So this is testing, testing your prototype. Um, And a lot of the times, whether it's with the activities that we do uh, for students or like the products, you know, so testing your prototype, um, you might, you know, we've got a food toy and I might test it to make sure like that the food fits in there. But obviously I want to use the audience that it's geared towards. So I want to put this in front of puppies. I want to see how they react to it. Um, And it's really important that uh, you're recording those reactions and results, whether they're positive or negative, because both of those types of information are going to, you know, help you uh, re- uh, reiterate, you know, and, you know, come up with a better plan um, after your original build. So, you know, testing also is very uh, critical, like, you know, going in there with the assumption like, oh, this is going to fail, this isn't going to work. And a lot of the times I do that myself with either curriculum or activities I've done with students and I go in and I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work. And so if you go in there with the puppy and like give them the toy and they automatically like, oh, that's not going to work. And, you know, you might miss out on what is working and like the benefits or like the positives. Um, So go in there kind of without just like a and, you know, open eyes with it, but also get other people to do the observations, too. I think Charlotte and I uh, were discussing this, that when you do test the prototypes, yes, you want a broad. 
Oh shoot, we lost Lionel. Oh, oh, oh um, yeah, there he is again. <laughs> yeah. Cool. DOE, DOE network, you know. Um, yeah. And so what I was saying is that not only do you want the a broad range of people testing it, but you also want other people observing it because you know no matter how hard I try that bringing my own preconceived notions of how well it's going to be. Um, you want other people to see things differently, you know, and get their feedback too. So, mm -hmm. And also recording the results are really important because you often aren't, aren't going to be able to get everybody in the room who wants to know how that prototype went. Um, so whether recording it by writing down notes, having actually someone who's just sole responsibility is taking down the notes is really key. So like, for example, when, when you, if you're running out of roles for your students to play in the design thinking process, actually someone who's the recorder, who's the documentarian, it's really important at this phase so that people can go back and see how those reactions took place. And uh, just kind of a side note, because somebody had mentioned in the uh, message board about how they're thinking about design thinking in regards to professional development or teacher training. I uh, yeah. was I sat in on a, a training um, where the presenter actually brought somebody in who their role was basically just to jot down notes and um, also, you know, walk around and ask questions to the participants, just getting ideas because when you're presenting, you're, you, you can't see everything going on because you're so focused on the presentation. And she brought up some really great points that even I as an observer be like, oh, I didn't even think of it that way. So yeah, having that external eye is definitely beneficial. So. Totally. And then last but not least, you know, what we said, uh, it's an iterative process. Um, just because you finish testing and you got that feedback, you don't stop there. You know, you keep cycling through and refining your your uh, your food toy in this <laughs> this this case. You know, keep going back and thinking about your audience, defining that problem, refining it, making it more specified. For example, if the food toy, you're going, oh, you know, it's just a food, it's a toy that where food comes out. You know, that's going to hit a wide, broad audience, but maybe you want to narrow your audience a little bit more and say, I want to hit puppies who are extremely intelligent and they they get through these food toys too quickly. So I want to make my food toy more complex. Um, so therefore, you're going to cycle through again and you're going to narrow that audience to understand it, narrow that problem. You're going to define the problem as I need this toy to be very complex and very engaging and then ideate through again. So that's why I use a picture here of like different food toys because these guys, when they're developing a food toy, they're iterating over and over and over again before they arrive at that final product. So that's an example of the design thinking process using puppies. So we're going to ask you guys a question. Why do you think design thinking is beneficial in classrooms? We've already used examples of how you could use that design thinking process in the classroom, but it's cheap. Uh, it's, I'm passing it to you guys. You get about a minute. Uh, why is design thinking beneficial in classrooms? Whether you've tried it before or you've read about it, why do you think that's important? Answer away. <laughs> now the message board on the just kind of slowed down. I know, it was just like blank. <laughs> All right, Hannah, thank you. Promotes thinking outside the box and ownership of learning. I really like that. Where, you know, the kids take ownership of learning. They're not passive learners. I agree. One important constant is to give everyone a voice. Yep. And it's an opportunity to think about the how, right? Once again, you know, we talk, talk about now in this age, we want our students not to be consumers, but creators. So, you know, thinking about the how allows them to transition into a creator. Co-constructing their understanding gives accountability to the students. These are all great, guys. Higher order thinking and collaboration. And I also saw one comment in there about how it unleashes creativity, but it also unleashes multiple ver ways of creating. So um, my primary focus on computer science, but you want to design projects that allow students to like pull from their strengths. So when you're this kind of process allows, you know, even if it's the student that might not be interested in computer science and isn't very arts and crafts, but really likes to talk. And so they're the part that like, you know, walk is kind of like the team leader and like gets to, you know, work through the um, defining the problem and, you know, discussing and, you know, uses that skill set. So it allows for a lot of student skill sets to be used. I agree. So here are some ideas that we jot down. You guys keep adding. These are great ideas. Um, I'm soaking it in. <laughs> but some pieces that we wanted to highlight is that the process actually, Lionel, did you want to talk about this first bullet point? 
Sure. So the process is flexible in length and can be adapted to different classrooms, uh, restraints and settings. So a lot of the times we think about uh, the design thinking process as kind of confusing a little bit with project-based learning where there's a large project at the end of a series of lessons. But design thinking can actually be done in very short cycles. Um, that, you know, the cycle that uh, we've been talking about to this point can be done in a 45 minute period. It's just, you know, you've got more constraints on, you know, materials being used and like how much time they have to plan. And it also, you know, given shorter amount of time with a kind of like easier defined problem allows kids to like think rapidly and like really, you know, flex their uh, thought process. So don't think that this has to be something that students are going to create over like a long period of time, like over a unit or over a semester. Of course, that can be part of it, but it can also be done in a lesson, like, you know, first five minutes presenting the problem. Okay, come up, you know, let's uh, popcorn some you know, possible solutions. All right, now draw me something, you know, so you can do this uh, process in a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you have to do the entire process either. If you just are focusing on uh, understanding and defining, that itself in itself is a really great um, nugget, right, to start off with um, when you're when you're talking about design thinking and also uh, just um, trying to uh, integrate those communication collaboration skills, um, which is the next point. And I've seen a lot of people mention it, 21st century skills. Yes, design thinking definitely fosters life skills such as communication, collaboration, and creativity. I mean, there's already an ideate phase in that design thinking process, right? And collaboration, because oftentimes with design thinking, you want students to work in groups. They have to communicate. They need to take on roles. Um, they need to work together in order to solve that problem. Uh, and it, uh, oops, sorry. Go ahead. And about the communication part of it too, like what was mentioned before is that giving students ownership of the project, it kind of, they're more likely to talk about what they're learning because it's part, like they have that feeling of ownership to it too. So. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed someone saying the FAIL acronym. Uh, can you spell that out again? First attempts. In oh, first attempts in learning. Yes, I love that. And that ties into the next point. <laughs> it's calling encourages growth mindset, failing fast and failing forward. What we mean by that is we want to encourage kids to fail, actually, because you learn from their failures and that informs their, their next iteration of the design. And so basically it highlights that whole iterative design process. Actually, when we're um, hosting at conferences, oftentimes uh, when we're doing a demo, a teacher will come up and we'll tell them to try something. And they, they hesitate. And I go, why, why are you hesitating? And she said, they, they will often say, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. And I pause and I go, what would you tell your students? Right? You want your students to make that mistake so they can learn, learn from your mistakes. So yes, fail and fail fast and fail forward. So would you like to talk about the last one, Lionel? Sure. And so uh, again, associated back with the promotes problem solving skills. Uh, that can be applied across different disciplines and subject matters. So, um, of course, you know, coming from a computer science education uh, curriculum writing and also uh, with Wonder Workshop, it, it might seem like, oh, well, this is only done, it was brought up like makerspace. Absolutely, you know, this is a science and uh, makerspace and computer science subject, but you can also do this in um, you know, language arts, you can use this in mathematics, you can use this in social studies. It's just, um, you know, changing the scenarios, like I think about, um, and now I'm blanking on, I think it's called like seven word, seven word stories, um, which was a language arts uh, activity I would do with my middle school students. Like, can you convey a whole story with just seven words? And it's really funny to hear students, you know, struggle with that because, you know, you're giving them kind of like the, the materials to work with, but like, okay, well, let's, let's do this in the design thinking process. You can definitely um, teach them that method. Too. And again, that's something that can be done in the class period or like, okay, you're almost there. Let's refine this. Like, how would you refine this? So, Right. Okay. Well, I got to quit up the pace because I've been told I'm at the 30 minute mark and then we want to make sure we get to the correct curriculum part of the cur curriculum design thinking process. Um, this is an example of how we integrated design thinking process into our K-5 Learn to Code curriculum, actually. So if you see here, we have six coding levels that kids can go through. And at the end of each coding level, we actually have an assessment project. So this is a great way to use it in your classroom. You end a unit with a design thinking challenge where kids actually have to apply what they learned to, to solve a problem um, using the design thinking process. So at the end of every coding level, it basically ends with that design thinking process, that design thinking unit.
And I think, Lionel, did you have an example there too? Yeah, and so um, here in New York City, uh, the Computer Science for All office, um, we've been working on something called the Blueprint. Um, and this is actually the, they just updated it between creating these slides, so it looks a little bit uh, um, cleaner, but um, we focus on concepts and practices, and one of the practices is prototyping, and really the steps in prototyping are what we're talking about in, design th in the design thinking process. Um, and this goes into not only the activities that we're creating for the students, but we have something called blueprint fellows who are like creating units of study. And we really want them to like prototype and test and do all these design thinking challenges um, that we face uh, with with our own writing and activities. Um, and I'll just put the, I just dropped the um, link so you can explore that a little bit more on your own. So it's just blueprint.cs for all the number dot uh, NYC and, you know, take a look at it and it's under the uh, CS fundamental, uh, CS foundation section. Cool, thank you. All right, now I was hoping to ask you guys, give you time to answer some of our questions, but because of that 30 minute mark, I'm just gonna use this as a overall question that we can think about as we move forward in this discussion. But this is, this is like a more macro level of how can we use design thinking, which we've already talked about is a great tool to use in the classroom, but level it one up, one step up and say, how can we use design thinking when developing our own curriculum, when we are actually the person going through the design thinking process. Now I use this image as an example because we created a set of 72 challenge cards to go with our robots where it walks kids through these coding concepts and activities. And in order to create these cards, we went through the design thinking process. And this is actually our wrap party. You see bottles of alcohol or champagne because we celebrated and we basically uh, like took lessons learned from our process. And you can see all the way starting from the left, we have these really, really old boxes and prototypes and we evolved. We went through that process over and over and over again until we find that product. So basically, we're going to talk about the whole design thinking process and how that's going to inform you when you're designing curriculum. So once again, that first phase is understanding your audience. And when we're designing curriculum, Lionel, Lionel and I are actually thinking of two different audiences, teachers and students. So Lionel, would you like to talk about teachers since you, you're often focusing on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a lot of the times, um, you know, curriculum can be written specifically for the students or written specifically for the standards or expectations, but there's not as much consideration for um, some of the problems or issues that teachers sometimes face uh, when trying to teach, you know, and so like for us, like trying to teach those coding concepts. And then it's also like, what do the teachers need to be successful? Um, do they need information that might not necessarily um, apply to what the students are learning, but they need it for their own understanding. So uh, one of the things that we do uh, when teachers are coming in, similar to like kind of how Charlotte did this at the beginning was, you know, what it, who who's my audience? You know, like what grade level do you teach? What subject do you teach? What's, what's your experience with design thinking? But I also ask like, what's your experience with computer science? Also like, how do you, what do you, what's your feeling about computer science? Because a lot can be told in like, it scares me or something like mm -hmm. that. So um, really getting to know, you know, who's going to be using your um, content. So, yeah. Yeah. For the students, which is the other half of your audience, you know, from when we're doing curriculum, we have teacher facing content and student facing content. For with the students, when we're thinking about them as an audience is what confuses students as they learned how to code? You know what? If you're not teaching coding, you know, insert blank, what confuses them uh, when they're learning how to read or when they're learning how to draw? And a key way to do that is to really sit down and observe a kid trying to learn that concept. Um, and, and say, okay, here's a problem, try and solve it and see what, what stumbling blocks they run into. And the same thing too is what resources do they need to learn the most effectively? Whether that's digital, whether that's physical, whether that's music, um, whether that's direct instruction, watch them and see what kind of resources are they trying or do they ask for out loud? And also what they're uh, saying without words, what they're looking for with their hands and their eyes as well. Um, so the other uh, question we had in, for you guys to think about is what strategies do you use to understand the needs of your students and teachers? So think back to when you're designing curriculum or you're writing that lesson plan, what strategies are you doing? Just like Lionel and I are talking about when, when we're thinking about it. Um, for us, we use a, a couple uh, different types of research strategies. 
So one of them is interviews and surveys. Um, we interview small groups of students and teachers about their coding struggles and successes. For me, there's a picture here uh, called education user research because I have the benefit of going to these different conferences across the nation. And we, uh, we meet one-on-one -on -one with teachers and in small groups to ask them, what are their struggles? What are the successes? We record their feedback and we bring it back with us back into the office and we, and we use that to inform our design. How about you, Lionel? Do you do any interviews and surveys? Yeah, so we definitely do, um, through the professional development, um, we do uh, surveys at the end of almost every session. And then after um, we finish a unit, I ask for feedback from the teachers on like what they think about the curriculum. Um, you know, and some of those could be very uh, formal, you know, like using a Google form and or some of it could just be like, what did you like? What didn't you like? Um, all of that can be very valuable information when uh, doing surveys and interviews. So. Cool. And the other two are classroom observations, just like I told you about. Go into a classroom. It might not even be your own classroom. Sometimes it's good to go into someone else's classroom and see how the students are coding in the classroom, how they're learning, what works. Write down what you think is working. Once again, positives and negatives are important. What is working and what doesn't work? And last but not least, research the space. Review the current curriculum solutions for that problem you're trying to solve, for that um, concept you're trying to teach. What curriculum tools are already out there? So for example, we decided to partner with code.org. And because uh, the reason why is because during my research phase, understanding the audience, I went and looked at all of the different resources and we realized code.org is really a great product that teachers love to use. And so we wanted to incorporate that kind of content into our curriculum. Next slide, let's see. So the next phase after we've take, you've taken a lot of time, and this actually, you take a lot of time trying to understand your audience. You go on to the next phase, which is defining your problem. And so when we're defining the main problems, once again, we look at the teachers and then the students. Lionel, would you like to talk about the teachers again? Yeah, sure. So um, it's important that you get teachers to help, like when defining the problem that you're defining problems that you can actually create solutions to, especially in regards to uh, whatever curriculum that you're trying to write. Because if you try to solve all the problems teachers face, um, you're not going to get anything done, you know. So, you know, try to fit in however you can. So, like some of the things, like, you know, didn't know where to start when teaching coding. So, like putting in, you know, curriculum, like identifying, like, here's a good starting point um, based on your, are you a beginner or an intermediate, you know, things like that limited amount of classroom time that's a huge thing with uh, especially elementary school computer science it's not a core content area so they end up teaching a lot of different subjects and they're trying to find that time so you know one of the solutions that came out of that like defining the problem is that when designing the curriculum which we can talk a little bit later is like content integration um, and then you know right the, there's desire to integrate coding with other disciplines and you'll also find that when identifying the problem, and this is very similar to, um, you know, even with the puppy toy, some of the problems that you have, there might be one solution for multiple problems. Um, so this is why it's also important to like really think through all those different problems that teachers might face because it's easier to create a solution that addresses multiple problems. So. Mm -hmm. And for the students, you know, it's a different set of problems, really. Students are diverse in interests and abilities. Now, teachers, yes, that is, it's also true. Um, but when you're designing student-facing content, you need to create complex, you, you have to keep complex instruction in mind. How do you create a product so that even if a kid is really advanced in coding and a, a kid who's just a beginner can both have a positive experience with it, right? So that's a problem that you want to, we defined um, when we were designing our curriculum. And for specifically for us, you know, we had a robot and we have a tablet. And when students work in small groups, the kids were constantly struggling with sharing uh, the robot robot and tablet time. So oftentimes I would see six students using one robot and one tablet and basically four of the students would just stand to the side like this while one or two students control all the learning. So we really said, okay, that's a problem we definitely want to solve. And last but not at least, we realized that very few opportunities were given to allow the students to reflect on and showcase their work as they were improving their coding skills. Yes, there was a presentation at the end um, where they could present what they did, but really actually creating a window in which students are taking the time to reflect and understand the benefits of what they just did. 
So after we do that, um, here's a question to think about too, is what other main problems do students or teachers have when coding in the classroom? We identified a few of them, but there's tons out there. So really think about it. Feel free to add it in the chat section. I have to keep going because of time restraints, but feel free to add it in, in chat and share your ideas. And just like a big overarching question right there, um, uh -huh. of like what a problem that students and teachers face and kind of related to what Charlotte just mentioned about like technology. And one of the biggest solutions, especially when designing curriculum is options. And so one of, you know, the answer for computer science is unplugged and online, you know, just that simple, you know, solution of creating enough unplugged activities to supplement online activities it, you know so when you design curriculum you're not all like oh it's just all online is that going to reach and you know all the students and teachers that you need or you know diversifying the content and allowing for unplugged and online like that's a really you know strong example of how what are some main problems with computer science so right so after we've you know, looked at all those problems, then we really define, we really, once again, that define part, part is not just the problem, but also defining their needs. So for us on uh, our end, we realized a couple buckets and someone said, I'm here to learn about scope and sequence. And we knew that we were going, okay, from all of our interviews, we learned that teachers want scope and sequence content that are connected to code.org because most of the teachers are using it and that are aligned with CSTA and ISTE standards. Um, they wanted adaptable curriculum because there are diverse classroom environments around the world. And so we needed curriculum so that could be adapted to all sorts of different environments and also lots of different implementation strategies. So giving you guys best practices so to guide you through how to adapt that curriculum. We needed differentiated personalized learning. Uh, we talked about that too. Students have different abilities, so they could. So we needed to give them an opportunity to work at their own pace, um, to have assessment strategies strategies and also scaffolded hints for the kids who are struggling and advanced extension activities for the kids who are excelling and they need more. Uh, last but not least is cross-curricular connections, just like Lionel said, teachers don't have a lot of time. And so we needed to make sure all these coding activities had those cross-curricular extensions so that the teachers felt like, okay, I'm getting more bang for my buck. When they're working with the robot, they're not just learning about coding, they're also learning about ELA and math concepts as well. Aligning that to Common Core and NGSO standards and also 21st century skills. So we knew the teachers and the students had a lot of needs. Um, I think, Lionel, you also had a couple um, uh, and, ways to look at it as well. Yeah, and so what's also important to understand, and this is something that we're trying to incorporate more into the content that we're using here in New York City, is the idea of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. Um, if you're familiar with it, um, it's a really, it's a practice of making sure that the content from the beginning is accessible to as many students as possible. And um, if you're not familiar with it, it comes from an architectural practice, uh, practice of universal design where architects were building structures um, that later on were deemed, you know, they needed to add a ramp or um, access for wheelchair. And then what ended up happening is that in, on the front of the building, they would put like retrofit a ramp and it kind of took away from the like aesthetic value of the building. So what architects are saying is like, why aren't we making these um, structures in our designs and our buildings accessible um, from the get go and incorporating it into the actual design of the building? So you know they created sloped entryways or wider hallways or you know elevators accessible on all floors, things like that. And it's really kind of the same idea. Um, in computer science and education is that like, you know, why aren't we making these things accessible to all learners from the get go? And the three primary things are, you know, making sure there's multiple means of representation, like is the idea and the concept being represented in multiple ways? And then also multiple means of action and expression, like are, do the students have different opportunities or different ways to express their understanding? And then finally, multiple means of engagement, which is often done by a lot of our teachers like, oh, you know, I give them choice. I give them, you know, um, I appeal to their, you know, likes and dislikes, which is great. Um, but it, it needs to be an element of not all nine of those things, um, but at least one of each of the three um, just to kind of reach more students. Yeah, you can use this almost like a checklist when you're designing cur curriculum, right, Lionel? Just to make sure, am I thinking about the, these different um, objectives as you're designing curriculum? Yes, absolutely, yep. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna keep on rolling here. The next phase is ideate, which I actually really love this part of, <laughs> of the phase as well. Um, you really are just brainstorming and coming up with 
different solutions for the problems that you just defined. Um, so when you're brainstorming, there's things you want to keep in mind. One is resources. What can we deliver digitally via an app or a website? Just like Lionel was saying, online and unplugged. What can we deliver via print and physical products? Because to me, the best solution is having a little bit of both. And then content-wise, define what is student-facing, what is teacher-facing, what are the assessment tools, what are the different ways you can assess your students and your teachers, and what kind of activities or projects should be included as part of the solution. So I want you to think about it in the back of your mind. What are some brainstorming strategies that you already use, either in your classroom or with your uh, cohort or your teachers? Um, here, I think, uh, Lionel, you can talk about it. You guys use Post-it notes to ideate? Yeah, a lot of the times post-it notes are used in the sense, and this is that just get the ideas down and post-it notes aren't as intimidating as like a large blank piece of paper. So you just write down your notes and then we just put them on, like you give a like a key uh, subject, like topic, and just like write down your ideas around it and you put the post-it notes up. And then what ends up happening is you start organizing them and you kind of like recognize that patterns develop. And so post-it notes are a really easy way to organize and, and recognize patterns and thought process. So. Yeah, and for us, we have whiteboard walls everywhere. We actually paint um, walls with whiteboard paint, just like the one behind me, where we can write and draw and, and plan out things together and ideate together. So we highly recommend that as well. Um, and then here's an example of what we did. So when we when, after we ideated on the whiteboard, we came up with a list of possible solutions um, when it comes to coding, different types of activities like unplugged or an in-app puzzle or design thinking project. And we use those ideas to present to teachers to get some feedback about which ones would work. How about you, Lionel? I think you have a slide here to showcase what you came up with. Yeah, and so uh, when thinking through the curriculum for elementary school, you know, these are two of the kind of um, ways that we thought about the process. The first was, and what we mentioned before, is like, what's already out there? What's we don't have to reinvent the wheel. What can we utilize and kind of like put in sequence? Um, and that's kind of the left-hand side. And how do we focus those? You know, do we do a K to two and a three to five? And then on the right-hand side of that particular slide uh, with the different badges, it's like, okay, well, maybe we don't even do that. Maybe we build around like themes of um, having student badges where they become like a storyteller and a game designer. And again, these were just ideas that we worked through and like see if they were viable or not. Yeah, that's great. All right, I know we got ten minutes left. Um, just as a heads up, so you guys get a get a sense of expectation, um, we're probably going to end the uh, try and finish the presentation by three. And then for people who have questions that want answered, just stay afterwards. Lionel will stay on for a couple more, an, another ten minutes to uh, answer any questions. So the next two phases were the prototyping phase, where you're planning and building. For planning, if you see this little scribble, um, this is my initial plan of our K-5 curriculum actually, where I'm actually outlining the different components and planning out um, how many of each of the lessons we were creating and how many challenge cards we wanted to make. Um, and after like making these little scribbles, we defined three components that we needed for our curriculum. And those were, we wanted to make challenge cards like I talked to you about. We wanted to create a curriculum guide that had solutions and hints um, for each challenge card and also those assessment strategies and worksheets and resources. And then we wanted lesson plans online so we can constantly update with new ideas and they were f they needed to be free so the teachers had something instantly ready to go when they had our robot. Uh, let's see, for you, um, what was your plan? Yeah, so, uh, so out of that previous um, uh, screen that showed like kind of the ideas, um, instead of doing badges, we kind of identified um, five major, um, you know, subject areas that we could focus on when implementing a year-long uh, curriculum, and then identify what's already out there um, and how they fit in, and then filled in the gaps. And so, you know, we started off with the uh, intro to computer science because um, every school year should start off with a little bit of this because you know you have new students or you know the summer lag, you know, whatever. So it just gives that opportunity to kind of get students in that frame of mind, and then. CS Fundamentals incorporates the code.org CS Fundamentals and different things that start teaching those like concepts of, you know, abstraction and programming and then robots. And this is where we use Wonder Workshop and uh, the dash and dot is to like, okay, they've done a little bit of programming in CS Fundamentals, but now let's see if they can 
you know, apply what they've learned to a different environment and like, you know, get something physically moving around. Uh, and then, you know, taking a next step further, doing project-based learning with Scratch and Scratch Junior, and then finally physical computing uh, to give a little more of that like hardware input output idea. And you'll see at the bottom that across it, you know, we recognize that unplugged and online device activities are important, but a balance of both um, across the board. Because a lot of times, you know, you'll be like, okay, we'll just do some unplugged at the beginning of the year, but then. Oh, we just lost uh, Lionel again. Hopefully you can yep. join again. Yep. All right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, and so really it's just a matter of making sure that there's a balance all the way through. So. Yeah, I agree. I, that's also why we chose to do challenge cards on top of the robot because we have the app and that's the digital component, but we realized we wanted student facing content that was off screen so that once again, when you're doing small groups, not one student was controlling the learning. There was a kid who could do deal with the challenge cards and have something tactile and someone else would be programming the robot on their tablets. So the next phase is build. And this is also a fun part where you're prototyping. And this is an example of all the different prototypes I went with, went through when we were de designing the challenge cards. And Lionel like laughed at this one. Um, so here's the box design from the left here, really flimsy. We didn't like this one, so we added eyes to it. And we moved along in this evolution all the way to the one on the right where you have tabs and the, the lid opens very elegantly. For example, uh, another example was the challenge cards themselves. Um, we were trying to figure out what the shape of the card was going to be. And we wanted to be really creative, right? And we thought these are really great ideas. And so then we built the prototype of a circle, a dash silhouette, and then a regular five by seven card. We showed that to teachers and instantly realized the circle was going to become a frisbee in the classroom. The dash silhouette was going to get rolled up and folded. And really, even though it's less exciting, the five by seven size card was the best uh, way to go. So um, that's we learned from that which ones to choose. And then the final product was like that. How about you, Lionel? What was your prototype experience? Yeah, and so the prototyping specifically for me was uh, the how to um, put all of this curriculum content together. And so uh, this horrible example of or an unorganized Google Drive was the example of the pilot year of the curriculum. And you'll see that there's a lot of folders and there's a lot of different colors. And it's just, you know, I feel sorry for the for cohort one teachers and they were very forgiving of this, but it was just kind of like throwing a lot, all, uh, a lot at them all at once. So if you go to the next slide, You'll see that from that uh, huge um, mess came a better way of organizing the content so it's more accessible uh, to the teachers and teachers outside of the actual program in PD so that if they went in and like went into this folder, they could identify like where to go first. And then if you go to the next one, next slide, uh, we're actually working on taking those again, those like five subject areas and creating a website so that the curriculum is actually just built through a website, yeah. And that way they can just, you know, say, okay, um, you know, kind of uh, self-select the teachers, self-selecting like how they want to Im implement the curriculum. Because, you know, one thing we have learned is that it's very difficult to do five subject areas of uh, computer science in one year. So maybe, you know, modularizing it. And so that's our goal. This website is not live yet. It's just the the second folder or the second image. Um, but this is our goal in the end is to kind of make this much more accessible to the teachers and the curric for the uh, access to the curriculum. So cool. All right. Last but not least, it's testing. Oh man, we spent a lot of time in, the, in this <laughs> this phase. Uh, we did a lot of different types of testing. So one was we brought printouts of these challenge cards, mock-ups to boys and girls clubs and other classrooms and had the kids try and complete the challenges while we sat there watching. So Derry, who's on chat, was actually part of the testing. And she you see her with that handy dandy pencil because she was recording the results and writing down notes and things that she noticed that the kids were struggling with with their challenge cards. We also had a survey beta testing. We're going to do that with Q curriculum, by the way. I see that in chat um, where we sent out mock-ups and PDF form. Teachers actually from across the nation and actually across the world try out these challenge cards and gave us feedback that we then use to help improve our cards as well. How about you, Lionel? You did teacher testing? Yeah, and so a lot of the curriculum that we've been developing uh, between the first year and second year was testing it with the teachers first. Like, not just going and be like, okay, here's your curriculum, this is what the kids are going to be learning, but like saying, here's the activity, here's what we're going to be doing, let's try this out. And so 
this was one of the ideas that we've been testing out um, with the help of Wonder Workshop. So like Brian Miller in the picture there was uh, taking that, um, you know, bear by island map, like floor mat, and creating a version that's kind of non-specific and you could do different types of activities to it. And so um, this was our SEP junior teachers testing this out and testing out the activities. Uh, I think there's another slide. There you go. Yeah. And again, you know, this was like a matching game and it was just really important. And this was like immediate feedback after doing these activities, like asking the teachers, like, what did you think? Who do you think this is going to work best for? Um, and sharing those ideas out. So. All right. Great. Oh, and this and is then, another one. Right. And then also, so I test it with them, but I wanted the teachers to also understand in the beginning of this curriculum, it's important that the teachers are kind of testing it themselves in the classroom and making it their own. So some teachers go in and they test out the actually activities um, with their students and kind of modify them to like what works best. So this is a teacher that took like, you know, the uh, airplane algorithm, but then associated with like real life algorithms. So they're making pancakes in that room, uh, which is really <laughs> cute. So. That's awesome. I also love pancakes. Uh, I know people are, are uh, uh, stepping out. I know we, we're running a little over time. But once again, this is just a reminder of the design thinking process and how you can use that to help inform your own curriculum design. Uh, we're going to answer some questions and answers, but let me walk through some uh, links real quick. Um, just in case you guys have to leave. Um, so one thing is I want you to walk away with this question. How will you use design thinking to develop curriculum for your classroom, school, or company? Really think about it. Take what we just talked about and, and help you inform your curriculum design, okay? And then uh, last but not least, uh, make sure you to visit uh, uh, Lionel's site here to get more information about his program. Yep, and yeah. so the top site, the blueprint uh, .cs for all .nyc, is the broader um, citywide implementation, and then that tiny URL uh, SEP Junior program is how we're developing the curriculum. Some of it you'll recognize because some of it is from Wonder Workshop, like their Learn to Code curriculum and Code.org, and you know Scratch and Scratch Junior, and some of it's uh, created in house. And somebody had asked like who's implementing it. As of right now, it's just New York City, um, but it's a Google Drive and a Google folder that anybody is welcome to uh, like go in and pull stuff from. The only thing that I do ask and in the testing phase is that if you do come up with a great idea, share it with me because uh, I would love to see what you do with uh, the curriculum. So, yeah. Awesome. And then for us, uh, don't forget, we have our code this week and we have our own landing page right here where you can go and try out some of our challenge card activities and also some activities for our brand new robot Q. Uh, so if you go to makewonder.com slash hour of code, you can get all those great activities. And also you can get more information about our learn to code curriculum at education.makewonder.com. We're adding those links over in the chat section. Um, and for those who have to leave, um, you don't have to leave. We're going to answer some questions and we're going to stay a little bit longer. But thanks for visiting if you have to leave and thanks for contributing your time. More information, you go to education.makewonder.com. Uh, once again, if you're leaving, uh, here's, here's our contact information. And don't forget to get your CE certificate. It'll be automatically emailed to you 24 hours after this webinar if you pre-registered. Um, or you can go to edweb.net slash code to get the recording of this webinar and make sure you join the community. Okay, Lionel, I know you're you're pretty busy. Uh, do you have time for about like 10 minutes to answer some questions? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so uh, should I continue recording maybe yep. the questions? Okay, so we're going to grab some audience questions here. Um, First question here, I guess, is for me. Um, are Dash and Dot different from the new Q ro robot? Yes, it is. Let me present that question here. Um, yes, it is. Uh, it, it's completely different. Um, our Q robot has a brand new app where you can actually program your robot using JavaScript, or the Q robot using JavaScript. It has four different personalities that you can choose from. There's a chat a feature where you can actually chat with your robot. Um, and also we're gonna create brand new curriculum to pair with Q next year uh, using this design thinking process. So for Dash and Dot, we've got these challenge cards that walk us through activities. For Q, we're really gonna focus on that design thinking um, process. The next question is, 
Well, we have that diagram available after the webinar. We can definitely make that available. Uh, we'll make it, yeah, we'll make it like an image and we can share it to, to you guys. We're going to send a follow-up email, so maybe I'll include that image there as well. Feel free to also add more questions. If you guys are still in chat, add more questions to that question page up top. What other states are implementing this step, Junior? Hey, Lionel, that's yeah. you. <laughs> so, um, as of right now, it's just a New York City, like I said before, it's only being implemented by New York City, um, but it's accessible to anybody. We, I do work with other districts, so, um, you know, uh, San Francisco Unified School District. Um, I work with uh, people from there and from Texas and Boston and kind of across the United States to kind of help build out uh, this content for uh, elementary school. So yeah, so right now it's just being, last year was a pilot, this is a second cohort, um, but the model and all the resources are available uh, for anybody. And please feel free to email me if you have any questions on like how to get it started in your schools, so. Cool, next question here. Oh, I'd love to be a tester uh, for your new cue cards and curriculum. Gabby, that's great. If you guys would like to try out our um, curriculum, uh, the cue curriculum, I'm working and prototyping it right now. And actually, I'm probably going to send it to Lionel's middle school folks as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, you have my email address. So please email me and I'll add you to our curriculum testing list because that's going to be really great. Um, I think that's it. Does anyone else have any questions? In 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I guess not, um, but you're welcome, Randy. Thank you guys so much for attending. Um, happy Hour of Code. And we will see you guys online. Feel free to send us an email. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, I, oh, it's like digital hugs to me. <laughs> <laughs> Randy says he's been using elements of design thinking to guide his students through the process of coming up with app design projects. Oh, nice. Great app designs. Um, yeah. Thanks, Anna. Don't forget to go to edweb.net slash code. I believe we're going to stop recording now. So bye, you guys. Happy hour of code.